We're going to, to have now a panel uh, with four experts in uh, high performance computing and machine learning. Um, during the presentations uh, that will take place, you can submit some questions to an application called uh, Slido. Um, you, ha you can see there what the address. You just need to introduce this hashtag, QuantMinds, and then you can submit questions. You don't have to wait until we start the panel. As we do the presentations now, you can already start um, sending some thoughts. And with that, let's go to a very quick presentation on uh, some ways that machine learning can be used in finance that are not typically considered. The typical application that people keep in mind when they think about uh, machine learning is that um, machine learning is for predicting predicting prices, and they don't realize that machine learning can be used in so many different ways beyond that, uh, beyond the traditional use of uh, what is purely predicting a price or predicting volatility or predicting uh, rates. In particular, um, the first application that you can think of where machine learning happens to be very successful is portfolio optimization. So uh, when you think of uh, the current paradigm of how portfolios are constructed and optimized, that's uh, mean variance portfolio optimization. This is a paradigm that uh, dates back to the 1950s and 60s uh, with the work of Harry Markovich. And it's essentially a convex, convex optimization subject to uh, inequality constraints. Now, there are better ways of doing this than uh, applying a, a, a minimum uh, variance optimization or convex optimization. In particular, the problem with convex optimization is that um, you are trying to produce a complete graph, a graph where every security or every instrument uh, can be related to each other. And it, when you think about it, when you compute a covariance matrix of, say, of size n by n, that involves uh, computing n times n plus 1 divided by 2 independent estimations of covariance, right? And that's not uh, something that traditionally is going to be uh, very robust. So when you think about it, if you have to compute a covariance matrix of, let's say, uh, 50 by 50 uh, on daily observations, uh, unless you have a stable correlations for the past five years, you're not going to have a, um, a very robust estimation of, of the covariance matrix. Let's go to the next slide. So in this particular example, uh, what I'm plotting on the left is a, a, the covariance matrix of uh, 50 by 50 instruments. And this is, a, this is a complete graph, meaning that in order to compute uh, the, pos the possibility of substituting, let's say, asset 3 with asset 10, uh, you have to compute a, an independent estimation of the covariance. And, and, and then you're going to use these Covariance, with, which very likely is going to be numerically ill-conditioned with a determinant very close to zero, when you apply that to a, a convex optimization problem, you will have to invert this covariance matrix. And because the covariance matrix is numerically conditioned, very typically, this is going to magnify the estimation errors. So a better way to do this is applying machine learning. You compute what is a, a minimum spanning tree that summarizes the structure of the data. And applying a tree structure uh, allows you to identify hierarchical relationships between the securities. The, the results that derive from that are much more robust because instead of having to estimate n times n plus 1 divided by two independent variables, now you can estimate simply n minus 1 relationships. You will require much less data in order to obtain robust, a robust characterization of the market. The second application uh, of machine learning that is not typically applied or you don't find in the journals is in order to identify structural breaks. Um, whenever you watch an interview on TV about a, an expert in machine learning, um, uh, very often this person will be asked about, well, should we actually believe that machine learning can do a good job in financial markets since these are models that are fit to fail? These are models that are purely based on historical observations. And very likely, these models are going to learn everything about the past that will never happen again. So this is a very common criticism of 
machine learning. And the reality is that there is some truth to that criticism, but probably it is overdone in the sense that um, every model, even models developed by our brains, are based on historical observations. They are not based on observations about the future. Um, so from that perspective, machine learning algorithms is, are not at the at disadvantage. But at the same time, uh, machine learning algorithms happen to be particularly good at identifying structural breaks. Whenever an observation is drawn from a distribution that happens to be very different from the distributions that have been observed in the past in a, in a high dimensional space. Machine learning algorithms are particularly good at identifying when an observation comes up that is not relatable to a dictionary of previous observations. So a very important application of machine learning these days that is not purely forecasting prices is identifying when there is a structural break. And I put here an example that essentially what it does is it computes um, a time series called SADF. Uh, it's it's a, a, a statistic uh, that determines whether a price is exhibiting a, an exponential growth or decay. Essentially whether there is a bubble-like behavior associated with this time series. And machine learning algorithms can use these sort of variables to identify what are the preconditions for the appearance of a bubble, right, or a bubble bur burst. It's not that they are predicting when the bubble is going to burst. They are predicting that there is a bubble in formation. And therefore, for instance, it, would, it might be a bad idea to apply uh, mean reverting algorithms in that context. <laughs> a third application uh, of machine learning that, is, that goes beyond uh, pure price forecasting is bet sizing. Um, so when you think of uh, the way algorithms uh, m manage a portfolio, very typically there will be an algorithm that makes a prediction whether you should buy or sell a security. And that's a very valuable uh, algorithm. Algorithms typically they don't have particular high precision or recall in that perspective, from that perspective. And very often what you end up happening is an algorithm that is very precise but it has low recall, or an algorithm that has low precision but has very high recall. And a, a very interesting way of applying machine learning algorithms is to have a, um, an algorithm that has low precision and high recall, and then supersede a second algorithm, a second machine learning algorithm, that is going to reduce the recall at the exchange of higher precision. Essentially, what you're doing is the second, the function of the second algorithm is to maximize what is called the F1 score, which is, um, it is a, a harmonic average of uh, precision or recall. And um, the advantage of that is that the second algorithm is not making a decision whether you should buy or sell security. It's making a decision about the size of the bet not the side of the bed. The side of the bed is still determined by the primary algorithm, which may not even be an algorithm. It could be a fundamental investor. It could be a discretionary uh, a, a portfolio manager. So the function of the second algorithm is to, to determine whether you should go or not for this bet. The fourth application is of machine learning that goes beyond forecasting is feature importance. And fe the, the purpose of feature importance is to understand what are the variables at play in a cause-effect relationship. Essentially, it would be like going back in time and meeting Sir Isaac Newton, and Sir Isaac Newton is trying to develop um, the, the um, law of gravity and, and the, the, the gravitational force equation, and essentially we are helping him identify that the variables that are really relevant for that equation are uh, mass and distance, not the shape, not the density, not the um, the, the amount of light that the body emits, etc. And once Sir Isaac Newton has the knowledge that the truly relevant variables that are useful in uh, predicting the forces of attraction between two bodies are mass and distance, now he can figure out what is the equation, right? The machine learning algorithm will never give us a closed form solution. They are non-parametric methods in many cases, and and the way machine learning can assist us in uh, doing research is not in giving us the solution, like a closed form solution. It's, it assists us by providing what are the variables that are relevant in a particular um, uh, phenomenon. And finally, the fifth application 
important application of machine learning that goes beyond forecasting is the, de the detection of false investment strategies. So what you can see here on this plot is what is the expected maximum sharp ratio associated with a random walk. And what this, sh this plot shows you is that what, if you are willing to run, let's say, 1,000 backtests on a random walk, the expected maximum sharp ratio is three. So is it surprising, therefore, that sometimes in journals you, you find a strategies with a expected sharp ratio of three? No, it's just a matter of the number of trials that the authors have undertaken in order to make that discovery. Um, so the problem with this phenomenon, this selection bias, is that you can achieve very high sharp ratios where there is no strategy at all. And machine learning algorithms can learn whether a strategy is a false strategy or a true strategy. That's something that I will uh, go into great detail in my presentation tomorrow at 9.50. If you're interested in these sort of, of topics, uh, you can find more, you can learn more about uh, uh, these applications in, in this book that uh, came out uh, a couple of months ago. Thank you for your attention.